Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, a show where we've explored the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. Today, we have a special guest, second time on the show, one of the first guests, actually, of our podcast. We're joined by Jerome Turnick, who's a founder and CEO at Smart Recruiters and author of his new book, Hiring Success, How Visionary CEOs Compete for the Best Talent. Welcome back to the show, Jerome. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing great. Good morning or good afternoon to you, Chris. Yeah, I can't believe that last time we spoke, it, we just started the business. We was in a tiny, tiny cubicle that we hired. Mm-hmm. <laughs> all, all we could afford at the time. And we was almost sitting next to each other, me and my co-founder Shane, because we had no room in this tiny little office we ha- had in central London. And you are one of our very first guests. So I really appreciate back then your support. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, well, yeah. That, it's amazing how <laughs> how much progress you guys have made and the community you've built. It's, it's really great. And yeah, it shows that good content when you're dedicated to a community actually works. Well, yeah, I can't believe it's nearly 300 episodes since then. And um, I, in the beginning, I, I, there was some points, I'm not going to lie, where I'm like, is this even going to work? I think that's a lot of people when they start putting content out in the beginning and there's no following and you have no yeah. traction, most people give up. And yeah. uh, I realized that it took literally years <laughs> of dedication to, to, to build a brand and do mm-hmm. that. But again, I appreciate you at the time reaching out and saying yes to, to, to sharing your experience. And I know so much has changed for you since then, uh, uh, the business, the new book and the, the success of your own event as well, which I've been following, which is just, you know, create its own movement um, as well. But before we jump in, tell everyone a little bit about yourself personally and your journey to, to where we are today. So my name is Jerome Turning. I'm the founder and CEO of Smart Recruiters, and we're a talent acquisition suite, kind of the generational successor to uh, a applicant tracking systems for enterprises. Um, as kind of, well, I was born in France, obviously, as you can hear, um, but I was going to say I was born, kind of born in recruiting. So my first business was a recruitment agency. I was 22 and did that for eight years. Then the internet came around. I was like, oh, this is going to change everything. So I'm, I actually uh, started one of the first ATS company over in London, actually, mm-hmm. and did that for 10 years, then realized that mm, actually ATS don't really make hiring easier. And uh, so what would make hiring easier? And I moved to San Francisco where I'm here today um, mm-hmm. and raised, uh, raised capital in 2010. Uh, we started Smart Recruiters and uh, we've now uh, about 300 people around the world and servicing over a thousand enterprises uh, on how do they attract, select, and hire amazing talent on demand, which actually is the recipe for hiring success. Amazing, and that's something that I really that, that I need that really inspired me from our first call, especially as I just started my own business. To hear your journey, you know, first and foremost, I was like a 22 year old starting a recruitment business. <laughs> I was like, how does that yeah. happen? <laughs> and then in the Czech were, Republic, in the ter- <laughs> in the Czech Republic, and then your ability to then see the you know um, you know see forward and and where you no know, where everyone else you know kind of took too much time you 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 piv- you just pivoted straight over and 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 mm-hmm. took the risk and the leap to 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 do that which where many others you know would have said you know you're very you're so early on in this you know so ahead of the game let's say mm-hmm. um, as well and then. You, again, you saw the next shift that was happening in the industry, and then you, you capitalized on Went that. On, yes, yes, yeah. yeah and really- move to the move to San Francisco uh, was important for me because um, I think you know if I looked at recruiting as a problem that has yet to be solved, like millions, hundreds of millions of people on one side, millions of businesses on the other side. Mm-hmm. Last time I checked, it's really painful to find a job. And 80% of Fortune 500 say they don't hire great people, right? So this problem hasn't been solved. I uh, saw that, I think- stat, by the way. That's crazy stat you just said. Let's not skip over that for a second. <laughs> 80% of Fortune 500 say that they yeah. don't hire great talent. When I saw yeah, that in one yeah. of your recent interviews, that was, I was like, really? <laughs> so, yeah. Shocking. Yeah, that's a, that's a KPMG uh, um, uh, survey, actually, from two years ago. And uh, what's interesting in that is that the other side of the survey is uh, 78% of CEOs put hiring top talent as their number one concern. So mm-hmm. the CEO understand that ooh, you are who you hire, like who you hire defines everything. It defines your ability to sell, to innovate, effectively de- defines your ability to compete as a business. So CEO understand this, but somehow it gets down the food chain. In, yeah. yeah, and once it reaches HR, it's underfunded and we are measuring ourselves by time to fill and cost per hire, faster and cheaper, right? And we're like, e- something's wrong here. Yeah. 
And that's actually what prompted me to write a book. And, and a lot of my life choices have been made through like, mm, there's a problem that, that needs to be solved. And, and our mission at Smart Recruiters is to uh, connect people to jobs at scale. Just as simple as that. Like, whoop, let's bring yeah. one, two and two together. That, oh, but that was going to be my next question is what is your why and purpose that you just answered it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, for, for everyone. When you was writing the book, one of the things I love to ask people to, to write and author their own book is what was the biggest learning moment that you had during the research phase? The, the biggest uh, surprises was how consistent um, the state of the current status quo is in most organization and in most industries, right? And it's like, well, it's really hard to find good talent or you're thinking a software developer or a data scientist, but then you talk to a retailer who's like, oh, it's really hard to find good talent. And, you know, you talk to a new factory and it's like, oh, and to a trucking company or to a hospital or to a government. And it's like, oh, it's really hard to find good talent. Mm. Um, so that like the consistency of it and the fact that most organizations look at recruiting still as, you know, the heritage of a staffing function where, you know, people are just being moved in a process as opposed to the new view of a sales and marketing function where you actually invest in recruiting to acquire better talent than your competitors. And if you yeah. have better people, you win, right? That's the difference between Motorola and Google, right? It's like, it's the people. <laughs> yeah, right? exactly. Could you talk about how the, the journey that you've seen? Because uh, over the years, hiring models have evolved so much. Yeah. Um, um, what what does the journey look like for you and where do you think is going to be going moving forward? Could you kind of give an overview of how you've of been course. unfold? Yeah. So we, and the names have evolved with it, right? Yeah. We went from I staffing. Struggling, I was struggling to say that then because I was like, which word do I use? <laughs> yeah. We started with staffing to recruiting, to talent acquisition, to hiring success, right? And um, uh, staffing really is, you know, the billboard at the entrance of the factory, you fill in a form, you're done. Then by the time we reach recruiting, we're like, hmm, actually, there is more to this. Like, we need to be more active to attract candidates. Mm -hmm. And then uh, people rename themselves as talent acquisition, right? Because it's really all about acquisition. Uh, but the truth is, it is about hiring success. It's about your ability to hire amazing talent on demand. And that takes both amazing talent attraction, marketing capabilities. We can talk about this, like a true marketing yep. function. Mm -hmm. Combine with engagement and selection, how do you actually select the best people at scale? And that speaks to collaboration and how we work with hiring managers uh, and run as a sales and marketing function. So for recruiters to be productive, they need to have the tech stack. And those kind of those three core pillars of candidate uh, attraction, candidate experience, if you will, manager engagement, collaboration, and recruiter productivity are those three core fundamentals of hiring success. And this is where this function is, is evolving towards. Um, and a lot of the jobs are, uh, that exist in TA today are changing. A lot of the technology is changing. We're moving away from, yeah, this is a back office function. Just send me a resume to, no, actually, I have this one headcount and I'm going to go get the best person I can in the market because I know if I get the best person, then my life's going to be easier then my company is going to get better, right? Mm -hmm. There's a real competition to uh, uh, happening there and the measures of success uh, are changing away from faster cheaper into more value add metrics as well i'm interested to know because you've interviewed so many people for the book and obviously your own experience what are some of the common mistakes that you're seeing companies make in the selection process the selection of candidates um they trust their judgment <laughs> it's the most common mistake i mean <laughs> like i love the honest <laughs> I've interviewed thousands of people all in my life as a recruiter and as an entrepreneur. I don't trust my judgment. I'm a good judge of character. Don't get me wrong, but I'll make mistakes. I have bias, right? Like, yeah. Chris, if you tell me right now that you like sailing, suddenly I'm going to like you just a little bit better, right? Because mm -hmm. we have bias. It's just yeah. like, hey, yeah, oh, yeah, you like sailing. Where were you sailing last time? Because I love sailing too. I, and this is my boat, right? And most people mistake... Uh, job interview for a chat a job interview is not a chat it is actually a structured interview that is that has a structured outcome that allows you to make a rational uh, decision without bias um, and so in in town selection um, we really recommend group interviews so team-based interviews transparent feedback scorecards based on must achieves and not must haves right 
must have five years experience in marketing, must achieve uh, uh, marketing our products in great ways. Right? Those are two very different things, yeah. especially today as, as jobs are more granular, trainings and certifications and skills and so on. So it's interesting to see that the old way of like, tell me about yourself just doesn't work. And it's not an efficient way of, uh, of hiring. Um, yeah. and especially unstructured interviews. Uh, and there are many like scientific cases about this. One I really like was the uh, University uh, uh, of Texas, actually, um, interviewed a bunch of candidates, uh, hired 50 out of 200. And then for some reason, legal reason, they had to suddenly hire another 50. So they just went back to the next 50 that they had rejected and, and just, they brought in and just brought in 50 more. Four years later, there was no academic performance tenure difference between the first batch of 50 and oh, the second really? batch of 50. Zero, which effectively meant that actually interviewing candidates was just a waste of time because it was mm -hmm. absolutely not a good predictor of any sort of performance, right? Yeah. And the reason why is they were conducting unstructured interviews. They're just like, yeah, so tell me about yourself. Do -do 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 -do. You know the classic one, right? Mm -hmm. So being more structured in interviews, uh, teaming up, the role of a hiring team, uh, putting um, uh, putting a peer uh, inside the interview team. Interviews are not just like the boss interviews the future uh, employee. It, a peer interview is very very good, right? They sell better, they they evaluate better. Um, so, yeah, and, the, uh, and I know something you're quite passionate about, which links into this, is obviously diversity and inclusion, uh, and making yeah. sure that the unconscious bias from that perspective doesn't play play a factor as well yeah i think the um, the way we structure our hiring um to to fight bias and discrimination uh, is a responsibility that we have as as ta professionals as chros right um, <clears throat> and we're seeing bias really at at multiple levels right we're we're seeing bias at the resume screening level uh, where um you know the same resume if your name is uh, Adam versus Mohammed, you actually get three times more callbacks as Adam than Mohammed. Just the same resume. Really? That, that's wow. yeah. That's actually scientific studies, right? So we're like, no, but we are not discriminating. Actually, yeah, this is a reality. If you want to try it on your own organization, you can, and you'll definitely get some of that variations. Um, mm -hmm. So resume screening to the point where the California state actually uh, passed a law encouraging businesses to use AI more in uh, recruiting and resume screening because AI removes the bias from humans, right? People have like, we have an AI product or an, you know, we call it smart assistant that screens resume and gives you a score and, and reads resume for, for our, our customers in the software. They're like, oh, I'm, I'm worried. Is there bias? Like, I'm like, yeah, there is bias. But there's actually a lot less bias than you reading the resume, as evidenced by you know uh, yeah. every study around, right? And so the that part I think is is one. And then the bias in interviewing is the second one. Mm -hmm. And for that, we uh, uh, what we do is so structured feedback, so scorecards where you have to feel exactly your opinion uh, transparently to the team, but cards down, so you only get to see other people's rating once you put your own. You know, influence, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, so it's like this. And then at the end, you got three candidates that have gone through three interviews each. This is your shortlist. And it's actually who you need to hire is written on the screen. Like literally, you can see the opinion. It's very hard to uh, to discriminate. But I don't want to say people discriminate, but just the bias that we have. We just have bias, right? No, no. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's, it's human. This is who we are. We like, we, our, our bias is a survival. Mm -hmm. right we just get along with other people that we can get support by and unfortunately that bias gets replicated in in recruiting and and uh, prevents people from building diverse team and diversity i mean diverse team perform better than non-diverse teams that's very simple right i actually i uh, i i talk about this at length in the book uh, but it's it's very clear that uh, if you want to have a high perform team performing team uh, then um, diversity is your best bet yeah um no i completely agree and uh i i was laughing when you, we first started this conversation because i was thinking about to some of the hiring mistakes <laughs> that i've made 
and it's because oh you play ice hockey oh yeah and <laughs> oh mm. and, and when i was a young manager even now it's hard not to sometimes to to be pulled mm. into that we're all is as i said it's in it's in it's in who we are it's, it's uh as well to do so but having a, a process in place like what you've just mentioned is, is is exactly what you need to remove that um as yeah. well so <laughs> to 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 make sure um it seems that, unfortunately, during my interviews and the work I do every day, it still seems that organizations see recruiting as an administrative function uh, that yeah. needs to be automated. Why do you think that that's still the case, given the fact of what you just said earlier, based on the research and the CEOs, why is it still seen in that light, despite the fact that we, get, we see the research of what you just said about 80% of CEOs? We measure recruiting through the wrong metrics. It's as simple as that. Recruiting is measured as a cost center. Time to fill cost per hire remain the most important metrics. Well, if that's your metrics, then how, how could you expect recruiting to actually add value? If you ask me to drive time to fill and cost per hire, I, I could bring it down to zero if you'd like. I mean, it's okay. Right? It's we like just uh, candidates and offer them job, like it is, right? It's like so, measuring the number of phone calls and prospects that you speak to for sales and measuring that as opposed to the sales. <laughs> yeah, it is, it, is, it is actually measuring, it would be like measuring your marketing department by how much money have they spent. Can you yeah, spend exactly, less? Exactly, that's what I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Of course, I could also spend zero, right, if you want me to. Um, yeah. We could cancel the advertising campaign. So the reality of recruiting is you want to have the right people show up at the right time very simple why don't we measure recruiting on that measures right and we've introduced uh, with our customers and across the industry now it's becoming popular those new re uh, metrics for recruiting which are measuring uh, time not in time to feel because if you say hey Jerome my time to feel is 57 days I'm like I don't care like start earlier right it's like, <laughs> who, who cares right uh, but if you say um, if you talk to me about hiring velocity, which is the percentage of positions that are filled on time, and you come and you say, hey, our hiring velocity is down to 75%, which means if I decide to invade Belgium, only 75% of the soldiers are going to show up on the day of invasion. That's a mm -hmm. problem, right? Yeah. So now I know as a CEO that hiring velocity translates into business velocity. Now I'm very interested in hiring velocity rather than your time to fill. Mm -hmm. Second, uh, we don't measure quality of hire. At the end, we're, this function is about hiring great people. So if you don't measure great, then you're just about hiring people, and that could be done fast and cheap, right? So we've introduced the net hiring score, which is exactly like an NPS, 90 days after a hire for prom hires. We ask the manager, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much of a fit is this person for the new role? And we ask the person, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much of a fit are you, or is this job for you? That's Interestingly. And then you take the nine and tens, just like NPS, nine and tens minus the one to six, and you end up with a positive or negative score that actually tells you, are you hiring more great people than bad people? Poor mm -hmm. fits, but not bad people, but poor fits. The first time we ran this experiment actually was at a very large tech company here in Silicon Valley. And in 52% of cases, either the manager or the candidate or both said, nah, not great. Are you bring this stat back to the CEO and like, hey, 52% of your hires are like, eh, not great. What kind of company are you building? Mm -hmm. So now you actually end up with a hiring success scorecard that has hiring velocity, business velocity, net hiring score, quality of hire. And we all know that a best, pro, you know, top level sales person sells three times more than, a, than an average one, that yeah. a, a great. So the financial metrics of the financial implication of hiring great people are measured time after time and they are an order of magnitude of your salary, the salaries you paid so there's a lot of money to be made here or to be saved and uh, so net hiring score uh, and hiring velocity and then you me you measure your investment which is your hiring budget not as a hard dollar like i spend a thousand two hundred fifty four dollar per hire it like, makes no sense but as a percentage of new hire salary five percent six percent seven percent eight percent so now you go to the board and you say, we're currently spending 5% of our new hire salary and we, we're achieving a velocity of 80% and a net hiring score of positive five. If you guys give me more money, I could drive our velocity to 85%. I could drive our net hiring score up uh, a few points to 15 
And that's the business impact. Now we're having a business conversation yep. because no TA leader has ever been to a, um, to a management meeting and said, next year, I think we should double our cost per hire, right? And when I say that, people laugh and I say, well, why not? Why not? What's in it for me? I'm the CEO. What's in it for me? If I give you more money, what do I get back? Right? Do I get yep. better people? Do I get them on time? So I think we first need to change the metric because once we change the metric and we start to measure recruiting for what it is, the ability to hire amazing talent on demand, then the business impact makes a lot of sense, becomes very measurable. And then actually the investment is measurable and you can make an investment. As long as we don't measure the outcome, then why invest? We had some questions on LinkedIn. I don't forget about everyone. Saud said, uh, what are uh, the most effective ways CEOs use to select their leaders? I think the, the selection of, uh, of leaders um, is just an amplification uh, of um, the normal selection of candidates. So first, I'd say um, in your talent attraction um, segmentation, leaders belong to the unicorn category. I explained this in the book, but effectively to have a good talent attraction, you need to segment your talent who has by impact, who has high impact and scarcity, uh, how hard it is to find leaders belong to high impact, high scarcity. So first of all, uh, smart CEOs actually put serious direct sourcing, head hunting um, dollars to actually uh, have a list of amazing candidates to choose from. Second, uh, they understand that they are in a selling role, right? That as a hiring manager, they're yep. selling the job. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they very much reach out uh, and, and are, part of the, are part of the process. Uh, uh, and actually sell and close, there's this very famous, um, uh, there is this very famous line from Steve Jobs uh, when he hired John Scully to be the president of Apple. And John was running uh, PepsiCo at the time, which was probably like 50 times bigger than Apple. So he's basically uh, yeah. offering the guy to come to a startup, right? Mm -hmm. And he ended up closing him by saying, you know, do you actually want to sell sugar water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to come and change the world with me? No recruiter is going to say that to the president no. of PepsiCo, right? No, so you're so going to get involved here, is what yeah. I'm saying. <clears throat> and then uh, make your, uh, your, selection, uh, your selection committee very strict. This is a process. So structured feedback scorecard, like exactly what you're looking for. What are the most achieved for this person? And a good uh, interview team, at least five people for leaders that are diverse in, in roles and in nature. Um, and once you have that, you have a good pipeline of candidates. You're deciding on good criteria and you have a good team to evaluate. You can literally watch it happen. You're in charge of selling. Those would be my kind of advice. Yeah. I've actually been frustrated in the past in companies where I've tried to encourage my CEO leader to get involved. And they're like, mm -hmm. now it's, it's, it's HR. You know, yeah. it's no, HR. No. It's like, no, I what? mean, at the, end, at the end of the day, who you hire as a leader defines who you are, right? Mm -hmm. it's, this is nothing to do with HR. Actually, it's very interesting. It's the opposite because when you think about it, recruiting is the only thing that HR does for you. Everything else you do for HR performance, da, 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 right? This you do for HR, great. Recruiting is the one thing that HR does for you. They're actually helping you be successful. Because if you hire somebody okay, or somebody great, what is changing? Your life is changing. Like this dictates, are you gonna get back home in time for dinner or are you gonna have to revise the deck and the presentation for tomorrow because this guy that you just hired didn't finish it in the way that you think is acceptable, right? Are you gonna make your quota? Are you going to achieve your target? Are you going to release your products? Like who you hire defines everything for a leader, it defines you as a leader. So if you're a hiring manager, if you're hiring, this is really not an HR problem. And you, are, you should be blessed that HR is here to help you. And you should look at it like this. And I think by automating the process and making it an administrative function, we run a very, very dangerous course. There's basically a race to the bottom where the managers are like, yeah, show me my candidate, right? Well, no, mm -hmm. that's not how it works, right? So yeah. bringing managers back in and the uh, hiring manager, recruiter collaboration, having a good collaboration here is critical to success. Mm -hmm. well, let's stay on this theme then, because um, who are some of the organizations that you've come across that have strong, a strong marketing component to the talent acquisition strategy? What can we learn from them and things that they're doing that we can adopt. Yeah. 
I think we're seeing, so we, we work with over a thousand organizations um, that use our, our software, big companies like Bosch, Ikea, Twitter, LinkedIn, so really a Visa. So a lot of big organization across all sectors. And we're seeing pockets of, uh, uh, pockets of best practices here and there. Um, the first thing I, I think is have a strategy. So you, you want to marketing, have a strategy. Your jobs as the product or effectively, right? You have a budget, you have a target market. So start by what would a marketer do in, in this situation? They start by segmenting their target market. So start by segmenting your talents, right? We segment talents between impact and scarcity so that you, you, have, you know where to invest money, right? People are easy to find. Uh, there's no need to actually dial uh, and do direct sourcing on LinkedIn, right? If they're hard to find, but you need a thousand of them, this is not going to work either. That's a marketing campaign. But if you're like high impact and uh, high scarcity, like you're looking for your next CEO, that's definitely a call. Start by segmenting your talent and then adapt uh, your talent attraction to that uh, with the four, four or five main components, right? Which are Job advertising works well for a, a low scarcity segments, and you can invest more depending on the impact. You have the direct sourcing, smile while you die. This is an expensive form <laughs> I of missed that uh, one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. Uh, this is an expensive form of hiring. It works well for unicorns, but it doesn't work well for experts, right? So you can easily direct source your next data scientist in charge of our, you know, self-driving VI call unit. Fine, that's a unicorn. But if you need to hire 25 uh, data scientists, you probably are looking at a marketing campaign. And that's the third part, which is an area we're seeing more and more people calling, oh, it's CRM or whatever, however you call it. It's just marketing, right? And we had the case here where one 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 customer actually uh, was hiring data scientists, and they they were just piling uh, sourcer, direct sourcer after direct sourcer, using agency, spending a ton of money until they put a young twenty five year old marketer to the problem, who actually took a nice piece of content, a white paper or an ebook actually that their chief scientist had written, put this on a web page with a lead capture form saying, hey, download the white paper. They run a small marketing round. They, they collected a thousand leads. From the thousand leads, of course, right? They filtered them down with two questions. Then they were like 800 qualified leads. Two webinars later, they had 200 qualified data scientists who were interested in getting into a recruiting conversation. So one person outperformed 10 sources, right? So you got to mm -hmm. ad adapt marketing techniques. It's a marketing job. And you said that you've seen that in the shift of the, the HR departments in some of their hires now. Yeah, I have a whole section okay. uh, on the book about like what is the TA team look like, yeah. and it's like the full stack recruiter who is an expert at marketing, an expert at interviewing, an expert at massaging the hiring managers, an expert like brrr, a logistic coordinator. This doesn't work anymore. So you gotta if if this is a sales and marketing function, then just like in a sales and marketing function, you have different uh, capabilities and different specialization. Marketeers is a clear one. Coordinators is another one, and really makes the recruiter. The recruiter is the uh, is the the business advisor. It's like a, a talent coach for the manager. That's the role of a recruiter. A recruiter cannot be that and be an amazing marketer and be a good coordinator and organize tribal logistics for candidates. And it just doesn't work. And then That's you end up with a yeah. mediocre recruiter yeah. who's trying to do everything. And you know what? When they talk to the hiring manager, the manager is like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. And there is no relationship, right? So we need to make recruiters stronger as business partners and equip them with the right uh, other colleagues to do the logistics, to do sourcing, to run programs. So um, it's an evolving function. But done well, uh, the gains are, are enormous, right? Because if you hire great people, your company thrives. My next question was going to be, you know, why is building an employer brand so important? But we kind of touched upon that already. But is there anything else you want to add to that? I think the the brand you you build is um, uh, is exactly like a product brand, right? You have your product brand, your investor brand, your employer brand, uh, and recruiting is an area where those brands uh, actually blend most. 
right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think when you think about recruiting, the impact uh, of poor recruiting, poor candidate experience on your product brand and your investor brand is absolutely massive, right? Um, and there's some good studies uh, here actually about um, the percentage of people who were canceling their Virgin Media subscription after being ignored by the Virgin recruiting team, right? And there's How a business case. Is, yeah, you, you saw that, right? Yeah. And, it, and there's many studies around this. Yeah. It's like, yeah, of course, if, if I apply to you and you never come back to me, then do you think that makes me more likely to go to your Good store point. next door? Yeah. No, right? And now you're like, okay, but so how many of these applicants do we get if you're the CEO per year? And you're like, oh, I don't know, <laughs> two million? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're disappointing two million people a year. Well, yeah, but you know, we are underfunded, right? So investing in, in the employer brand here is, uh, is important mm -hmm. because this is where the overlap between employer and product brand and investor brand, shareholder brand are, is, the, is the biggest. Yeah. And also the new kind of generation coming through when they look at, you know, a, a going to work for a company, it's not like when we were younger. Now they're looking at their social media page. They're looking at their glass door. They're looking at their LinkedIn. They're looking at you know, those specific CEOs and leaders, vote their profiles and their brand. And based on that, they're making their decision as well. And you, you can't in the past, you could hide. There's no hiding anymore. <laughs> With glass door, social media, it's, it's very transparent. Uh, and yes. as, as much yes. as companies try and create this false <laughs> facade of who they are, you get found out very quickly. Yeah, um, yeah there I is had, no hiding. There is no hiding. And also, I had, I had a few friends recently join some very high profile businesses. And what they were promised on the front end and what they were delivered when they joined was like so far away. And they, and they, mm -hmm. and they, and they left because yeah. there was this brand perception was completely, I would say falsified is a bit str strong. But. Well, it's, it's actually the most uh, common cited reason for why people are disappointed in your role. So when we do this net hiring score calculation uh -huh. and I said, we ask the candidate on a scale of one to 10, how much of a fit is this job? If they answer something bad, we're like, oh, why? why? And then there's a couple of questions and the answer that says, the job is not what I was told is by far the most popular really? one. Really? That's crazy. Yeah, that, yeah. 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 <laughs> that's a big issue that is such a big issue especially after the amount of money resources er that both sides are put into it both sides of course, are put of in course. into it as yeah. well and you lose those hires uh, yeah, yeah you do you do um so lots to uh lots to improve in recruiting and frankly a lot of money um to be saved or to be made by hiring great people like i think this is the one thing that organizations really have to focus on it's like okay so if really a great developer can develop four times more than an average one, why would I hire anyone other than a great developer? And how much could I actually afford to pay to hire a great developer? Like if you start to go down that line, you actually say, okay, let me fund a proper recruiting operation because you know what? I'm taking all the great developers. The average ones, they could go work for somebody else. Um, one of the things that I picked up on uh, when you when you said when you first started Smart Recruiters, you surveyed people and job seekers and asked them, "What do you guys want?" Can you share everyone the, the responses that you got? Can you please tell me what happened with my resume? Was the one thing that people told yeah. us right, and to this day, it's a it's a fight. And I actually, so we designed the software to that. We said, All right. One thing we're going to do is when, as a recruiter, you change the status of a candidate, you rate their resume, you do something in the software, we're going to tell the candidate, someone has reviewed your application. So very uncommittal, no compliance or you know liability, very simple. But then many companies in the beginning were like, oh, wait, they're going to know that I've seen yeah. their resume? I'm like, yeah. You know, yeah, they, they're going to know. And I remember getting in the beginning in pretty heated conversation, like we need to switch off this 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 feature, right? And I'm like, no, we cannot do that. Like literally, if, if like, and I found myself one saying, look, if, if you don't want this feature, you should pick another vendor because we're going to help you deliver great candidate experience. That's part of it. We're going to fight for the candidate here, but we, ultimately we're going to fight for for your success. Yeah. But that's one of the things, right? And it's it's it was a change. By now, 
it's not a problem anymore. Like millions of people, they expect it. We get like 3 million applicants a month. Uh, everybody gets to know what where they stand. And actually now we see raving reviews from candidates that says, oh, I, I love the, how, you know, whatever visa is done. They gave me uh, some feedback. And our customers are taking, you know, the, the reward of it. Um, so, I mean, last time I checked, you know, candidates are human beings. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to ask that question. Because what, yeah, when I saw it, to remember that. yeah, it's an obvious answer, but it's so impactful. What I loved about it is how you stuck to your guns, where mm -hmm. others, others would have just said, you know, okay, we'll turn it off. But it's so yeah. important. And it's, yeah. it's me, everyone listening to this uh, podcast right now or on LinkedIn Live, they, everyone can relate to that. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Can relate of course. To how frustrating that is. Well, if, if I may uh, uh, then. Uh, given the times we are in today, if there is one thing that I would love for you to do out of this listening to this uh, um, to this LinkedIn Live, it's not to go to our smart recruiters website to buy our software or on Amazon to buy the book. The one thing I would love for you to do is go to your ATS right now and post the jobs you are not hiring for and inform all the candidates that have applied in recent weeks that those jobs are on hold for now. Right, because right now the number one problem for people who have been laid off, who are in transition, looking for a job, is knowing whether these jobs are real. Mm. Of course, you can use this moment to pipeline talent, but then do it through a CRM, building community. Say we're not hiring for now, but please, and you should by all means do that. Actually, it's a perfect time to accumulate leads, future candidates for hard to fill jobs and for graduates. So there's a lot of really good things you can do with talent pipelining. Just don't use a job to pipeline talent. This is unfair for the candidate. Sorry, that was my one minute candidate no. experience uh, well, pitch. I, I was going to I was going to ask you, you know, what's your parting piece of advice? But I think that was yeah. that's perfect. And given the current times we're in right now and the uncertainty, we don't need to give people even more uncertainty. And it's a time for TA to step up. Uh, it really is. Like, we are in the business as talent acquisition professionals of matching people to jobs, right? And right now, a lot of people actually have lost their jobs, are about to lose their job, are not sure about their job, our organizations are redeploying. So now is the time for us to step up and step up as a function using uh, our technologies to do redeployment and internal mobility, making sure we minimize the impact of any redeployment and uh, uh, and outplacement or uh, external placement that may be happening. And in many organizations, that's, that's the topic of the moment, right? Um, and using this to actually level up uh, our TA practices, right? Level up your, your teams, uh, go back to these campaigns like learning. Oh, I heard we should do marketing campaign. How does that work? Level up on this. Uh, replace your technology. We're actually seeing a lot of customers or prospects, companies that says, you know what? Now is a good time for me to replace my ATS. I've been sitting on this 20-year-old ATS for ages. I never had the time to do it. Now my hiring volumes are low. I have like one, two quarters. Now is a good time to do it. Yeah. We're going to save money from it. And just step up and, and use this moment as almost the gift of time in TA, right? If you're in HR, you're probably worrying about a thousand other things, and I respect that. If you're just in recruiting, if you're focused on TA, then use this time to level up, participate in the redeployment effort, and upskill your own team and yourself. Amazing. And last but not least, Rowan, where, where can people connect with you, learn more about Spark Recruiters, you know, grab a copy of the book? Where's the best people to go? Play to go? So um, um, learn more about Smart Recruiters on smartrecruiters.com um, or uh, on the hiringsuccess.com website where you find a definitive guide to hiring success, which is a practitioner version of the book. And so uh, the book I have here, you can find it there on it Amazon is. because this is really a, a recipe for CEOs that says you should invest in recruiting. Well, look, thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time. Out, it's been a pleasure as always, Jerome. And uh, I'm really looking forward to getting through the book myself actually haven't had time to finish it as well. We've just all going on, but definitely going to jump into it as well. And um, obviously, uh, hope, I hope we hope to see your events back soon as well. Um, as well, we'd love to, to see those, if not if not in person, online, hopefully. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well. uh, they've been amazing. Apart from that, Jerome, enjoy the rest of your day. And um, I look forward to seeing you again soon, okay? Yeah, thank you for having me, Chris. It's all right. See ya. Bye. Bye.